Today, we're talking DLC. For how long fighting games have been adhering to the games as a service model, we've only just gotten started when it comes to obnoxious monetization. That said, I guess it's preferable to having to spend money on a new game or games. Anyway, this video is more about the meta implications of DLC characters. I see people get mad about losing the DLC sometimes and, you know, fair enough. While I don't believe there's a board of fighting game developers rubbing their hands together and conspiring to make characters overpowered and release them as downloadable content to boost sales, there have been a surprising amount of disproportionately strong DLC characters, especially in some recent fighting games. We already have instances of characters being made overpowered intentionally, with Yun and Yang in Super Street Fighter 4 Arcade Edition. That $5 to $7.99 price tag is usually just an excuse to try something new, but sometimes it's a recipe for evil. This time, we're going to be talking about DLC characters that made the meta their playground and completely took things over. The only real rule I have is that they have to be a separate downloadable character. The aforementioned Yun and Yang from Super Street Fighter 4 Arcade Edition won't be counted as they were included with the Arcade Edition package. Similar rules apply towards characters who were part of a season pass or had an early unlock you could buy but were still in the base roster on launch, such as Kuan and Yuni too. With that said, let's get right into it and see just how much power that 5 to 7.99 USD can truly grant us. I've mentioned this many times before, but you can often point out one or two DLC characters in DBFC's lifespan that defined the different eras of its competitive history. GT Goku in Season 2, UI Goku in the beginning of Season 3, Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta by the end of Season 3, and Lab Coat Android 21 after that. The latter is maybe the most maligned character in the game's history, to the point of being banned from tournament, but in my opinion, none of DBFZ's DLC had as profound an effect on the game as the very first, Bardock. Releasing just two months after launch alongside Z Broly, Bardock immediately stood out in numerous ways that were almost unprecedented given the kind of game Season 1 DBFZ was thought to be. At this point the game's roster was only 24 strong, and it was a pretty toned down game compared to what it's become. Not that there wasn't insane shit in vanilla DBFC, but it was more crazy fighting game stuff, like Android 16's looping meterless hard knockdowns with his command throw, or the launch version of Super Saiyan Vegeta's assist that couldn't be reflected on block like it can now. Even then, what Bardock brought to the table stood out in a big way in the relatively tame world of vanilla DBFC. A character with an extremely fast, half-screen advancing punch that was minus one on block, there was nothing like that in the game. This move practically played the game for you. It was beyond abusable, both in neutral and as a part of Bardock's pressure. You could vanish after it to make yourself plus and force the opponent to gamble with Reflect to get out, but remember it was minus one in this version of the game. An important thing to note about DBFZ at this point is that frame data for jabs was not standardized. In the current version of the game, everyone has a six frame jab, but that wasn't true back then, which allowed Bardock to bully characters with jabs slower than six frames without even needing meter or assists. In a game as scrambly as DBFZ, it was an immensely powerful tool in the neutral thanks to the speed and range. Bardock flinging himself at you meant you couldn't overextend, lest you eat shit, and often players would stay in the air to try to avoid getting checked, but this only made you more vulnerable to air-to-airs in Super Dash. Between this, his great key blast, and his famed auto combo which does enough vacuuming to put Roombus to shame, Bardock controls screen space like no one else could. Then of course, we have the infamous level 3 super. If you played this game at this point, you saw this super all the time. If you watched the game at this point, you saw this super all the time. The reason for this is quite simple. In DBFZ there are two kinds of knockdowns you can inflict. One allows you to tech and recover after it, and this is usually referred to as a sliding knockdown by the community. The other forces you to recover slowly on the ground, which is known as a hard knockdown. Bardock's level 3 caused a hard knockdown, and it left him extremely plus on hit. Bardock's post-level 3 Okizema made him a monster in wake-up situations. Mix-ups in general weren't that strong in most situations, but off a level 3 super knockdown, Bardock suddenly became very good at opening people up, and with how good he was at bashing heads in and confirming into vanish, it wasn't uncommon to see Bardock level 3 a lot. In case you wanted to really cash out for damage instead of Oki though, Bardock could also very easily combo his level 1 supers into each other using other assists or by DHCing from other supers. This was especially strong with Cell, which made him and Bardock a powerful shell. Granted, this took a shitload of resources, but it was worth it if you needed the character kill. From the moment he released, Bardock became one of the most prominent and successful tournament characters. 
CEO, Combo Breaker, Evo, he was extremely common in all of them, and he was used by players who placed very high, ultimately culminating in Sonic Fox winning Evo 2018 using a Bardock team against Goichi, who was also using a Bardock team. Even after nerfs to Lariat's frame data and his level 3 Okizeme, he remained extremely strong. He was just fundamentally too good not to use, and his synergy across the cast was amazing. You could pair him up with the aforementioned Cell as well as other flexible top tiers like Kid Buu, and he worked well as both a point and middle thanks to his assist being very strong. There was nothing he wasn't good at, and he quickly established himself as an icon of versatility in DBFZ, standing out as the strongest character in the first season passive DLC by about 5 country miles. When Season 2 rolled around with more new characters and patches, Bardock remained a frequent pick despite the nerfs. Funnily enough, he seemed to inspire numerous system changes. I mentioned his strong level 3 Oki getting nerfed, but actually tons of characters had their level 3 Oki Zema toned down. They also dished out a universal nerf to the damage of combos that had multiple level 1 supers, and guess who suffered the most from this nerf? Despite this, Bardock had some other tricks up his sleeve for Season 2. This was the meta of snapbacks. If you perform a Dragon Rush in DBFC, you can bring in your opponent's other characters. In the current version of DBFC, the opponent can manually adjust the timing of when their character comes out. This was not possible in older versions, which basically meant you were guaranteed a mix-up after a snap. On top of this, it was later discovered that a kind of mix-up known as a fuzzy could be performed. These were some of the only genuinely unreactable mix-ups in the game, which made them extremely strong. Universal fuzzy setups that worked on the entire cast were quickly discovered, and Bardock happened to have the ability to do this. How lucky! He could easily set up snapbacks without meter via the medium version of Lariat. Thanks to this and his general strong kit, he continued to flood tournament top 8s throughout 2019. Nowadays, Bardock is generally seen as a low tier, usually occupying the bottom 5 slot. He's not bad by any means, and you can still win with him. It's just that by this point in the game's life, what made Bardock so strong is just the standard now. Everyone has big fuck off neutral skip specials along with higher damage, better mix, and more exploitable tools, making Bardock seem woefully underwhelming in comparison. He's like an angry old man who refuses to do what the young people are doing, just coasting along, living off his glory days. He played the game so extremely well, but the game ain't what it used to be. He did have one final second win in Season 3. This was the season to introduce selectable assists after the game launched with every character having one predetermined assist. Bardock's A assist is a good one, with fast startup and low block stun, but his B assist was crazy. Trading off the A assist's fast startup for extremely long block stun, it's a great combo extender and block string tool, limited by its poor range. Well, in its debut, it fucking tracked, and it had full screen range, letting you easily confirm off of plenty of stuff from a really long distance. It was pretty busted, but it didn't last particularly long, and once it was gone, so was Bardock's spot in the top tier. It's a bit sad to see Bardock having fallen so far, once the king of the game but now a mere court jester swinging away with his auto combo. With DBFZ preparing to receive yet another quote unquote final balance adjustment, I'd definitely like to see some buffs for the guy. Maybe he'll never go back to being the big dog of DBFZ like he was so long ago, but I have hope that someday, the lone warrior will return. You know, it's kind of surprising to me how relatively balanced SF6's DLC has been. Seeing as how the closest any of those guys have been to Broken was the Rashid Infinite Yasar bug, we'll have to go to its predecessor SF5 instead. With how over half this damn game's roster is DLC, you'd assume there's plenty to choose from, and there definitely were some very strong standout DLC characters like Akuma and Yurian. To me though, two of them really take the cake and I kinda had a tough time picking between them. The first is Abigail, who represents maybe the absolute strongest character from any era of SF5 with how absurd he was during his peak. I decided to opt out of talking about him though for two main reasons. One, he wasn't that strong on release and it took a ton of buffs from a patch to make him so dominant. Two, there's already a fantastic video by Big Yellow going into Abigail in more detail than I could ever muster. So instead of Abigail, we're going to be taking a quick trip to Memphis. Luke was the final character in the final season of SF5, and the last character to be added overall. What a way to end the game's lifespan. There's a 
poetic beauty to Capcom deciding to preview SF6 by adding its protagonist to SF5, already gaining the ire of fans because of his fuck-ass Logan Paul design, and then further pissing people off by making him the best character in the game. As a base, Luke follows in the footsteps of other Shoto-esque characters. He's got the classic Fireball DP combo, but he sets himself apart with numerous unique characteristics. First, his Fireball is anything but conventional. The traditional Street Fighter Fireball shoots a lingering projectile that travels horizontally across the screen. Contrasting this is Sandblast, which travels extremely fast across the screen, but has more limited range. Your standard Hadouken or Tiger Shot tends to travel full screen, but even EX Sandblast will just miss at the absolute farthest range you can toss it. This creates an emphasis on using Sandblast at mid-range as a poke, and in that sense it excels with fairly fast and unseeable startup and travel speed. Used in tandem with some of his longer ranged pokes like Crouching Medium Kick, it's great at pestering opponents. His DP is fairly standard and acts as his main tool for anti-airs and as his metered reversal. The other two specials that Luke has to his name are Flash Knuckle and Avenger. Avenger is a command creepy crawl with two possible follow-ups. The Shoulder Charge is a decent combo ender and meaty tool. It's normally minus 4 which is punishable, but after the right combo ender you can time it so that it's plus on block, making this a very solid tool to have. The other follow up is a low crushing overhead. It's pretty slow and easy to react to, with 16 frame startup combined with Avenger's initial 13 frames. It's unsafe on block and extremely punishable, and does a paltry 100 damage if it hits. Not a move you want to be using all the time. Flash Knuckle is a character defining move, but also arguably the biggest barrier to entry. Each version has a vastly different effect on hit, making each of them stand out in regards to their utility. This is further bolstered by the fact that each version can be charged, further enhancing the properties, making combos possible with medium and light knuckle, and making the heavy version plus on block. Given that the charged versions are pivotal to his combo structure, you definitely want to get good at timing your charges, lest you miss out on Luke's high damage. Finally, we have Luke's V system. V skill 1 is a pretty cut and dry move. On activation, it enhances Flash Knuckle, with the uncharged version acting like the charged version. With V skill 1 active, the charged versions become even stronger too. V skill 2 you'll probably be familiar with if you played Luke in SF6. It's Suppressor. Rest assured, it's just as obnoxious of a pressure tool without dry brush. It's safe on block and special cancelable, and the big step backwards that Luke takes makes it a primo shimmy tool, perfect for baiting throws and dealing a devastating punish. Between his two triggers, the generally preferred one was V-Trigger 1. So the funny thing about Luke is that what made him so good was nothing extravagant. Like I said, he's basically a Shoto. These kinds of characters tend to be all-rounders, with a versatile kit that's strong in many areas, but not completely all-powerful. This is what makes Luke stand out. He wasn't top tier because he was good at everything. He was top tier because he excelled at everything. Instead of being a jack of all trades master of none, he was a jack of all trades and master of everything. While he wasn't doing any full screen zoning without VT1, his projectiles gave him extremely strong mid-range presence and it was surprisingly hard to get through this zoning even with SF5's many strong anti-fireball tools. Many of Luke's buttons also move him forward, which furthers the threat he poses at this range, and many of these buttons have target combos he can confirm into for a knockdown. Let's say he gets into your face though. With numerous plus on block buttons, good pokes, and a very good throw, his pressure is formidable. This button crushed dreams like nothing else in SF6, and believe it or not, it was also extremely good in SF5. Once you were in the corner, you had to be prepared to hold it and find a way out, and Luke himself had a great 3 frame jab for defense. And if he gets a hit, his damage made 2 touch into stun situations not just realistic, but common. He chunked health bars easily with the right starter, and combined with stray fireball hits and throws, he could end games very quickly. A big contributing factor to all of this was his incredible V-Trigger 1. I mentioned it was his preferred trigger for most matchups, and that's because it was just absurd. While it's active, it allows him to throw a full screen fireball that knocks down on hit, does mad chip damage on block, and very easily allows him to confirm out of his fireball, or most things, for very good damage. It's a 2 bar trigger letting him gain access to it fairly quickly, but what truly made it stand out is the unique way his triggers work. With most SF5 characters, V trigger meter slowly drains by itself and drains further each time the trigger is used. Luke manages to slip by that rule with a trigger timer that fucking goes up as time passes and if he lands any attacks. Under normal circumstances, his trigger lasts for 3 uses, but if you play your cards right, you can greatly extend the amount of time you have to use it. 
However, obviously if the momentum slips, you can also lose it way before you even get the chance to use it, so be careful. Luke's amazing buttons and the incredible Shoto tools he boasted successfully made numerous other Shotos damn near irrelevant. There was little reason to play Ryu or Ken because Luke just did everything they did but better, and that extended to a lot of other characters who didn't even have Shoto tools. Now, obviously every character is different and you should play who you like, but uh, if the best character in the game does everything and is a small step from a Shoto, then why not play them? Luke was at the forefront of the final year and a half of SF5's Life in the Limelight. Numerous players picked him up and it wasn't uncommon to see top players with Luke secondaries. The likes of Joe Ume Rogan, who now goes by Thunder, Punk, Tokido, and Mena RD all picked him up to great success. The latter notably used Luke throughout his Capcom Cup run in 2023, ultimately securing his second ever Capcom Cup championship with the character after beating Zhen in Grand Finals. He also got complained about a lot because of how common he was. He didn't kill SF5, obviously, but certainly he killed some people's enthusiasm. While he didn't win absolutely everything, he was still a very common tournament character and a successful one at that. It's also worth noting about his very late release in the game's lifespan. The small amount of patches that came out after Luke's release did adjust some aspects of him, but uh, clearly it wasn't enough. Perhaps he would have eaten more nerfs with future patches, but he managed to escape relatively unscathed despite other top tiers like Akuma and Abigail being nerfed in a much harsher way that hurt their viability. Thankfully, after SF5, Capcom re-evaluated Luke's design and decided to adjust him for 6 to make sure he wasn't as powerful, and Luke was never prominent in tournament again. All I can say is, beast mode baby. You know. Tekken 7 came out in 2015. The final DLC for this game came out in late 2020. I don't know if that makes me feel older or younger than I actually am. Back on topic though, you should have known damn well who would be occupying this segment once I mentioned Tekken 7. Launch Leroy was so goddamn overpowered that even to this day, five years after his release, his page on Steam still has mixed reviews, with the majority of the negative reviews mentioning how broken he was easily one of the most infamous top tiers of the last five years to come out of any FG, and admittedly it's hard for me to articulate why since I don't really have much Tekken experience. Nonetheless, I will try my best. I remember when I was watching a sea of Dragonobs at EVO this year for Tekken 8, and I told a friend who played that it was hard for me to tell what made a character in Tekken top tier. He responded by basically telling me that it can simply just be the result of two or three overtuned moves. That doesn't bode well for Mr. Smith here. Not too dissimilar to Luke in SF5, the reason for Leroy being top tier was a simple matter of him just being really good at everything, which I guess in Tekken's case is just beating the mess out of people. Hermit Stance is supposed to be his character defining tool, I think, allowing him to mix your shit out of it. Leroy is all about getting up close and personal with strong pressure. He had lots of incredible strings at mid-range and his frame data was very impressive. Out of all the many moves he has, seriously, how do y'all Tekken players keep up with this? One of the more notable ones was his back 1 plus 2, a safe on block mid that launches on counter hit. Trying to press buttons near Leroy was a dangerous game, because getting whiff punished by this move hurt. As well, his up plus 4, known colloquially as orbital, was a fast, low crushing move that launched on hit. This move was insanity, sporting surprising range and being safe on block and relatively hard to whiff punish, as well as very efficiently catching sidesteps. Leroy's mix was some of the most terrifying to go up against, and on defense, he had his parries to keep him safe and call out buttons or delays in strings. The property that tied all these wonderfully broken tools together was Leroy's damage. Even on a simple starter, he could absolutely delete health bars, and his wall damage was just… on another level. Counter hit back 1 plus 2 allowed him to just melt characters, and with how strong his mix-ups were between his lows, his staggers, and orbital, it was just so hard to defend against him. The real kicker is that, while Leroy's damage, pressure, frame data, and overall offense were among the best in the game, most Tekken players considered him very easy to use. He's still a Tekken character, but compared to others, he was pretty simple to pick up and play. Easy to use, easy to master, and strong at literally everything a character needed to be good at? Sounds like a recipe for disaster, and it was. The primary victim of this Leroy invasion was EVO Japan 2020, which took place just one month after Leroy's release. Luke and Bardock were very common tournament characters, but even they weren't nearly as widespread as Leroy was at this tournament. Even so early in the character's life, his incredible tools made him such a safe and strong pick for this tournament. By the time Top 8 rolled around, people were sick of this character, and for good reason. How many Leroys do you think were in Top 8? 
two, three, maybe four? Try seven. The crazy thing is, while quite a few of the players used him as a secondary, some of them only used Leroy. This left Mikio to absolutely fight for their life as the only player in this top 8 to not touch Leroy. Arslan Ash, the EVO champ of 2019 for Tekken 7 and the Tekken 8 EVO champ, was one of the few players to not jump on the Leroy train and ended up getting 25th, a very uncharacteristically low placement for him, indicative of how much people struggled against Leroy if they decided not to pick him, even if they were world class. The sheer volume of Leroy players at this tournament and the fact that he won truly does make Leroy stand out as one of the most egregious examples of mishandled balance in a relatively recent period of time. He probably wasn't broken so much as he was just hilariously overtuned, but goddamn. As you'd expect, this version of Leroy didn't last particularly long, eating nerfs as early as January 2020. Many of his best strings and buttons saw reduced damage, worse frame data, and the like. The February 2020 balance patch was entirely dedicated to keeping Leroy in check, and it worked as not only was he considered much fairer, but he was never seen to the extent he was at EVO Japan. EVO Japan 2020 ends up as an outlier in the history of this game's balance and causes Leroy to stand out as one of the most overtly busted top tiers of the last decade. And you know what the funniest thing is? Leroy came out on the exact same day as Gon Ryu, and no one cared because of how busted Leroy was. I've heard he paid for his sins early on in Tekken 8 as well, so there's that. Even though I used Gold Lewis as an example in the intro, none of Strive's DLC characters will probably ever reach the level of infamy that Happy Chaos did. Coming out as the third character in the first season, which is funny considering he's one of the main antagonists in the story mode, while Gold Lewis and Jacko weren't looked at very highly in the meta, Chaos immediately stood out. Unlike the prior three characters I've discussed, Chaos is not really an all-rounder. Mr. Happy here excels primarily in screen control using his gun. Now I'm regretting not making any jokes about this in my Alessi video. Chaos's game plan primarily revolves around his gun stances. He has two he can enter, Steady Aim which is 214S, and At the Ready which you can enter with 236S or by simply hitting Heavy Slash. In both stances, Chaos can use Heavy Slash to fire bullets, although the effect of each vary greatly. With 214S, Chaos is unable to move or attack while in the stance, and he can't block in either stance. This is fine though as you can cancel them out at any time you wish and Let's be real, neither you or I bought this game to block. To make up for how limited he is in this state, 214S's gunshots are incredibly powerful. They do high damage on hit and combo into each other, as well as guard crushing on block. The other stance is definitely the more overtly busted one. Tired of having to deal with such outdated game concepts as offense and neutral? 236S baby. Unlike with steady aim, at the ready allows Chaos to move while he's in the stance. He can dash, jump, and air dash. Now, here's the silly thing. Before looking into Happy Chaos, I was under the impression that he had to manually aim the reticles in both of these stances, kind of like Elfelt in Exert or Alessi. This is not how it works. In both stances, Happy Chaos's reticle will automatically home in on the opponent, and the bullets will track them with perfect accuracy. Now, the reticle may take some time to reach the opponent, but once it's locked on, it's like glue to the hair. You're not getting that shit off, so be prepared to shave. In this case, it's shaving life from your health bar. While this applies to both stances, what makes At The Ready so much more powerful is that while in this stance, not only is Chaos still able to move, but he can still attack. All of his normals work as usual, with Heavy Slash firing the bullets. While in this stance, Chaos has access to absolutely smothering offense. Any button can be made plus on block and used as a frame trap, because if you try to contest him, he can fire a bullet and get a counter hit conversion. Oh, and he can also set up tick throws with the bullets because he can indeed still throw, and he can also use the bullets to combo off an uncharged dust, a luxury not afforded to many other characters. If you're not game to use this stance for pressure, he can use both of his stances for very efficient zoning, while simultaneously being able to shut down most zoning himself because of the speed of his projectiles. These bullets are seriously absurd and allow Chaos to become very versatile. Even though it's not his primary modus operandi, his rushdown was surprisingly good for his owner. Trying to contest him with that godforsaken reticle on you is ill-advised, so often players would try to wait out the duration of the stance, but if Chaos can get a hit and pick up the momentum, then this plan doesn't become sustainable at all for the opponent. Chaos's other specials besides the stances are all pretty helpful too. 236P throws a grenade that curses the opponent on hit. Under the effects of the curse, the reticle of both stances will have significantly improved tracking. 
This applies both on hit and block as the grenade is technically unblockable and it goes through other projectiles. 214k is roll, which does just that. The roll can pass through opponents allowing for strong crossups and it can also low profile many pokes. Finally, we have the clone, a move that sort of sat in the background as many people were more focused on the power of the stances. The clone is indispensable though as a fantastic defensive tool. The clone will absorb any strike allowing for pressure that's safe from a barre or stalling from longer ranges. However, this comes at the cost of some of his health, so watch out. It should be pretty obvious why this guy was so good for so damn long. The amazing offense he gets from his stances anywhere on screen allows him to shut down so many characters and made him absolutely terrifying. Bow before the shirtless messiah. So what's the trade off? Two words, resource management. No one gets to shoot for free. All suffering has consequences. Chaos has two unique resources he must contend with over the course of a match. The first is, of course, bullets. Similar to Eltnum and Uni, Chaos has a limited stock of bullets, and every shot from his gun consumes one. You can reload your bullets with 2-2-P, but this obviously takes a fairly long time to do, especially if you're reloading an entire stock. The other is his unique meter, Concentration. Happy Chaos does the thinking for the player, but every time he enters a stance or fires, it drains from the meter. When the meter is empty, Chaos cannot use any gun moves until it comes back, and it does so very slowly on its own. However, you can expedite the process of the concentration refill with 214P, Focus. Focus will not only refill the gauge slightly, but it also causes the gauge to drain at a slower rate with each shot fired, giving him more shots per use. Unfortunately, this move does have a particular weakness to balance out the strength of a meterless refill. It's very slow, with a staggering 41 frame startup. Still, the concentration recovery and buffs definitely do make it worth your while. If you have meter, your options to get your brain back on track are even more plentiful as both of his supers can help restock his resources. Deus Ex Machina restores his bullets on top of causing a hard knockdown, while Super Focus fully restores his concentration and applies the focus buff. Both of these supers are 50 meter and Chaos himself was able to build meter quickly even when his bullets were blocked, so this is quite a nice bonus for the blue man. Despite how strong he is, Chaos is actually fairly difficult to play. While the nightmarish power of his offense thanks to his stance is undeniably extremely powerful, Happy Chaos players need to remain constantly aware of their bullet count and focus as he needs both to remain an active threat. Without them, he's borderline worthless, so getting caught with an empty clip and empty brain is something he wants to avoid. Also, his defense is a bit spotty with no DP, if you want to pretend that's a legitimate weakness. Upon his release, he became one of the most notorious characters in the game. Players like Leffen and Umisho picked him up, and with his strengths were able to see great success. Notably, both of these players won EVO using the character, Umisho winning in 2022 and Leffen winning in 2023. He also found his way into top 8 in the likes of CEO Taku, Versus Fighting, and Combo Breaker, altogether establishing him as a major force in the meta. It also took Arxis a long fucking time to nerf him meaningfully, but eventually his winning streak came to an end, with the December 2023 patch increasing the amount of concentration he spends with his shots. These were enough to get Leffen to begin looking for other mains, with him opting for an ABBA secondary that he used in Grand Finals of CEO 2024, where he ultimately lost to Umisho. Umisho on the other hand has exclusively switched to using Soul, but there are still lots of other strong Chaos mains using him to good success today. Even with the nerfs, he's still powerful and terrifying in the right hands. Funnily enough, Skullgirls is actually the oldest game I've talked about in this video, in spite of this particular character only coming out in 2021. Wild that the game even received a season pass basically a decade after its release, but Hey, I guess that's just a testament to the game's dedicated community. Rightfully deserved, that's for sure. This is also the most expensive character featured in the video, which I figure is worth a mention. With that in mind, let's talk about Skullgirl's second Encore's first DLC character, Annie of the Stars. How appropriate that the game's first DLC release ended up becoming one of the strongest and most prominent high-level characters in the game. There's a lot to take in when it comes to Skullgirl's mechanics, but let's talk about Annie's kit first. Annie is a fairly versatile character, but as a base, prefers to play for the mid-range. She doesn't have the longest range normals, and while she does have an air dash, it's kinda slow, so her mobility is generally subpar compared to other characters in the roster. Her stand medium punch is pretty gigantic for a character of her archetype, and she has some good jump-ins, but for the most part, she finds herself outranged and outmaneuvered. 
may not sound like a glowing endorsement to play the character, but the strengths she brings to the table more than make up for it. I know I mentioned her normals not having the greatest range, but in up close situations they shine. With Jump Heavy Punch acting as an incredible jump in and a dive kick, she has ways to make up for her below average mobility. Even if she isn't zooming around the screen, her movement can be very threatening when considering the different ways she can start her offense in the air. On the ground, the aforementioned standing medium punch as well as crouch medium kick gives her access to very long range pokes with which she can start her offense on hit or block. Also, her jump heavy kick is a really good normal that stalls her movement slightly and had the unique property of refreshing her OTG. OTG stands for off the ground and is a term used to describe hitting an opponent while they're on the ground. In Skullgirls, you get one OTG per combo, but Annie's JHK would actually restore your OTG on hit, allowing you to land another one. Pretty crazy. Going into her special moves, she has a Shoto inspired moveset, but I guess it'd be more accurate to say she was inspired by Soul Bad Guy and Terry Bogard, with some equally ignorant shit ready to be abused. Her fireball is rather unconventional, traveling along the ground slowly. The medium version is a great combo extender, while the heavy version is good help in neutral and mix ups. It's large and moves very slowly across the screen. It has fairly long startup, but anything Annie does becomes way scarier when she has this bastard on screen, be it getting in with IAD normals or trying to perform a setup on an incoming character. The long startup can also sort of be circumvented with assists. Her DP is… well, a DP. Fully invincible and fairly fast, with 13 frames startup on the heavy version, but also utter death on block. Would you wake up DP with a million on the line? You can't super cancel it on block, or even on width though, so keep that in mind. You'll get more use out of it as an assist, but I'll get to that later. Burn Knuckle, or uh, North Knuckle, sorry, is primarily a combo tool. Annie takes a massive step forward when using this special, which gives it, especially the heavy version, amazing corner carry. Also, the aforementioned dive kick. As far as burning meter, she has one super that stands out in a big way, but I'll get to that in a bit. Besides that, we have a beam which is best used as a solo combo ender, and a forward charge which is best used when DHCing into Annie. Her level 2, Pillar of Creation, is also a great DHC option, especially since it tracks and she can combo off of it from anywhere on screen. Her level 3 creates a lingering projectile that keeps the opponent in block stun for about 10 years, during which you can enforce any pressure you want all while dealing great chip. Altogether, her meter use is extremely flexible. Now that's the basics of Annie, but getting into what made her so ridiculous requires we divulge into the game's mechanics. Skullgirls is a team game, even though you actually can just play with one character. Generally, teams of three tend to be considered optimal. Adding more characters to your squad reduces their health, but also grants access to so many benefits that offset the lowered survivability, such as DHCs, assists, and the ability to restore red health on characters that are low. Annie is a very strong solo character, let's get that right, but a character like her shines not just as a single unit, but also as a team player. As I mentioned, her DHC potential with Pillar of Creation and Meteor Strike is very strong. DHCing into these supers also gave Annie extremely high damage potential, especially if you had lots of meter to burn, which is insane considering everything else she can do. Her assists also give her a leg up on the competition. Skullgirls has a unique mechanic that allows you to set almost any attack in your character's moveset as an assist, but thankfully, all Annie needs is her default. A good DP assist can be a lifesaver in this game, and Annie has that in spades. Her DP assist takes its incredible vertical range and pushback on hit and turns it into one of the absolute greatest defensive tools a team can have. But why is a DP assist so essential in this game? Well, let's talk about that. At the forefront of Skullgirl's offense is resets, the act of dropping a combo with the intent to mix the opponent up and start another combo. This is because of the infinite prevention system, IPS for short. The IPS triggers when this little bar under your health is filled, and upon being completely filled, the opponent can burst out of your combo. It's in place to prevent moves from being used too often in combos, so resetting combos is the most efficient way to prevent it from being activated. This turns Skullgirls into a highly stressful game of guess the mix-up, and if you guess wrong, you'll often get hit with resets that will loop until your character is dead. Having a DP assist allows you to blow through these types of resets very easily. As far as Annie's resets go, she can perform left-right resets thanks to Jump Heavy Punch's ginormous hitbox that crosses up, as well as cross-unders with her standing heavy kick. She also sports a command overhead and a command low, that is a standing normal so it's evil, and she can reset with her throw on the ground and air. This ground throw has massive range, so be wary of it. Finally, to cap off this laundry list of advantages, we have star power. 
22KK will trigger an install that caused all of Annie's normals to fire out stars. These stars will improve their damage and frame data, allowing her to enforce even stronger pressure without even needing assists as many of her normals become plus on block. That's on top of the immense chip damage the stars caused. Combined with a relatively long duration, it's quite terrifying to go up against. It is rather costly, but the reward is certainly worth it. Annie was defined primarily by her high damage off of DHCs, her very strong approach thanks to her fireball, and her sheer versatility. She ended up being a strong pick for many teams, and it's interesting to see that she was often played in different positions on different teams. At EVO 2022 Skullgirls Tournament, Sonic Fox, The Kill Sage, and Pen Pen made top 3, and all three of them used Annie on their teams, with the character being placed on different positions. Usually she was in the middle to take advantage of her DHCs and DP assist, but in Grand Finals we did see Sage switch to Annie point for that set to great effect as he managed to reset the bracket and almost win the whole thing, narrowly losing to Sonic Fox. A very impressive showing by the players, and definitely a solid showing of how good Annie was. However, as the pattern emerging would suggest, she wasn't going to get away with all this nonsense forever. She was eventually nerfed in a patch that toned down the frame data of her fireball, decreased the damage off of DHCs and the meteor strike, increased the size of her hurt box as her small size would actually cause certain combos to not work against her, removed the OTG refreshing properties of JHK, and most importantly, severely nerfed the install. In the current patch, Star Power's stars only fire off on heavy normals and they drain from the gauge. With how recent this patch was, it probably remains to be seen how effective Annie is, but given the sheer versatility of her kit, I think it's safe to say she'll remain the star of the show. Killer Instinct's competitive success definitely didn't compare to Tekken or DBFZ or Strive, but look, I had to find an excuse to talk about this fucking goober at some point. Releasing during Killer Instinct's third season of DLC as a pleasant surprise to all five Battletoads fans, we have Rash. I wonder if this guy was what spurred the release of the Battletoads reboot just four years later. Rash, adorable little scamp he is, also ended up terrorizing KI players for a very long time. Much like with Tekken, it can be hard to narrow down what makes one character better than the other for me due to the universal nature of the combo system, but in spite of this, the overall design of KI's characters more than make up for it with lots of unique, character-defining gimmicks. What KI lacks in character-specific combos, it more than makes up for it with pretty much every other part of its character designs. Rash is no exception. Sure, he may not be as unique as a Maya or an Agonos, but he still has lots of unique tricks to bring to the table. What he lacks in an attractive name, he makes up for it with raw power and total BM. Rash boasts impressive mobility for this kind of game. He sports the unique ability to run instead of a regular dash, as well as Wicked Tongue. Eliciting memories of Spencer and Marvel 3, Wicked Tongue lets the giant toad man zip around the screen. If his tongue makes contact with an enemy or a part of the stage, he'll travel to it. Since he can use it to get to an opponent and use his air normals after it, it's a great approach option and he can vary up his movement in many tricky ways. It also sports the ability to absorb projectiles and builds a chunk of meter, so against characters with fireballs, you've got quite a nice ace up your sleeve. Rash is one party-loving toad, you could probably tell by the sunglasses, and his game plan is all about fucking shit up and having a good time doing it. First up, his buttons. They're amazing. So many great pokes, a stupidly good jump and would jump medium kick which also crosses up, a command overhead, and a target combo that's special cancelable at any point. This combination of a strong ground game and his amazing air mobility makes him very slippery and hard to pin down because he can control the pace of neutral very well. In case you want to take the festivities to another level of obnoxious, we have Battering Ram and the dreaded Wrecking Ball. Both cover incredible amounts of horizontal ground. The Ram is pretty fast and the light version is safe on block, although on whiff the recovery is long enough for most characters to punish your ass. It's also his best grounded special for starting combos. The Wrecking Ball is absolutely insane, traveling very far, moving at an angle that's pretty hard to anti-air and has a hit of armor that allows him to blow through projectiles or anti-air attempts with the greatest of ease. Not a fun move for new players either, believe me. Big Bad Boot is a move which acts as a solid anti-air thanks to its large vertical range. The heavy and medium versions launch allowing for juggles. You're probably noticing by now that a big strength of Rash is just how fucking huge so many of his moves are, with giant hitboxes that exercise very good control of the stage. Rash's offense is fast and furious. With Wicked Tongue letting him perform air normals after connecting with an opponent, he can use it as well as the Wrecking Ball to get in very quickly and start running some very strong mix, poke the shit out of you with his long range normals, or perform stagger pressure with his target combo. Toss in some throwing with all this striking and Rash gets even stronger as his throw lets him carry the opponent for a second or two, allowing easy side switches without having to hold back and input a back throw. 
and once Rash has a hit, he can make it count, with extremely high damage. The sheer length of the animation for the medium and heavy big bad boot can make them easier to break, but if he can cause the opponent to guess wrong and get locked out, he can just melt health bars. Battering Ram is a good extender for this purpose as it's faster and harder to tell between the three versions, thus making it harder to break. Also, if you're going to play Rash, you better learn how to do his juggle combos. Thanks to Wicked Tongue, air to airs with Rash are fairly common and he can combo off these thanks to the boot's juggle potential for solid damage as well. For spending meter, you'll mostly use Shadow Big Bad Boot as an invincible reversal and anti-air. Now for Instinct, which is an install every character can use with differing effects. Rash's is the speeder bike. He can call these anytime he wants at the cost of some instinct bar, with a slight cooldown between bikes. He can use them in combos or to make some of his more unsafe specials less risky, making for a very strong instinct that makes his powerful offense even more ignorant. Who cares about being minus when you have the speeder? Rash is extremely powerful, no doubt about that, but he definitely didn't break or change the game like some other characters I've talked about did, which is probably helped by how balanced KI is. Still, lots of strong Rash players like Not Alex V were able to do great things with him. It took a very long time for him to get toned down, but eventually the Anniversary Edition patch released in December made some aspects of his kit less belligerent. He's still a very viable pick though, for winning and being a shithead. Look at him go. And that's all I have. It's fun to observe the many common strengths these characters all share, such as high damage and versatility. Perhaps these characters would have been just as hated if they were on the base roster, but I think they stand out much more as they released after the meta of these games began developing. There are plenty of other busted DLC releases, but this is all I had the time for. Thank you for watching this video. Have a great night, and take care. Hey everyone, thank you for watching this video. Uh, apologies that it took so long, but I kind of got sidetracked in other stuff. I was grinding Street Fighter 6, and also the 2XKO beta came out yesterday, or alpha came out yesterday, so I played a bit of that. But uh, anyway, we are at the point of the video where I thank all my lovely channel members, so thank you to Old Man Han, Cami the Killer, Jazba, Mortis, Arg Seals, Wormy, Terry Hints, Perfect Orange, Pet Shop from Fortnite, Happy the Hap Hap, HPHK, Gundog92, Warfuls, Isaac the Collector, and Kira the Stowaway. Thank you all for the support. I love you very much. Mwah, mwah. Kisses for all of you. Um, thank you guys. Uh, thank you all in general for the uh, support you've been showing. The channel recently hit 20,000 subscribers, which is absolutely mind-blowing to me. Uh, thank you so much. I really can't even put it into words, so I won't try. Uh, thank you very much. I love you all. Thank you for watching. Thank you for... Uh, you know, supporting the channel. I hope you got, I hope you all enjoyed this video and, uh, I love you all. Have a great night.